As if the internal arguments at Red Bull weren't bad enough, we've got to take a look at what's going on further down the grid, because if Red Bull aren't careful, we could easily see them repeating what Alpine did with Piastri. Because rumours were abound that Liam Lawson was at it again, and that Daniel Ricciardo was supposedly out of a seat, but as early as this weekend. And that's just one of many things going down this weekend at the San Marino Grand Prix, because let's be honest, that's what it's called, and not the word salad that the Emilia Romagna Grand Prix has turned itself into. And by the time I would say its full name out in its entirety, the entire weekend would be over already, and we'd be already predicting what would be going down at the Monaco Grand Prix. But another thing that might be over and done with are the odds of Liam Lawson getting a seat within the Red Bull group for 2025. Something that he was initially promised last year, but slowly that promise is looking likely, and more likely by the day, to be broken. After promising him a seat for 2025, Helmut Marko has not only rubbish speculation about the New Zealander replacing Ricardo for this coming race, that initial promise has now been watered down to something that they would look at in the future. Right off the back of Christian Horner saying that Liam getting a Red Bull seat is something not preset or preordained or that it would even happen. But I understand that trying to predict who is going to be racing for Red Bull next year is practically impossible at this point. It could change by the day. We're still not entirely sure about Max Verstappen's situation. That talk is still not going away because Toto Wolf is making sure that it doesn't. It's still become one of the biggest conundrums in the entire F1 community, especially where Sergio Perez's position will be. Because right now, even though he did have a bit of a troublesome race in Miami, he is doing the business enough for Red Bull to think, well, why would we need to change the status quo? So long as Checo is second place in the driver's standings and he guarantees us a Constructors' Championship again, why would they need to replace him with Ricardo or Tsunoda or even the Kiwi? And as a result, it's realigned the Racing Bull driver's mission in trying to just save their own futures in the sport, instead of trying to go after something that even Carlos Sainz is trying to get into the mix with. And quite honestly, he would be a more interesting option, even though I don't see it happening in reality either. Now, the main point of this video is that this isn't just something that Helmut Marko has suddenly said on a whim that Liam Lawson, oh, he's not replacing Daniel, and it might be something in the future. No, this was in response to something that was going down in the New Zealand media that I'm not entirely disagreeing with. So this is the actual quote Helmut said. Ahem. The rumours that Ricardo will be replaced by Liam Lawson at Imola are nonsense. Oh, I like saying that word, nonsense. Liam's manager from New Zealand was there. Apparently, he has certain dreams, and these are being announced through some media, including from New Zealand. There is absolutely nothing planned in Imola. Well, I mean, Helmut. There is a race being planned in Nimola, so that's not entirely nonsense. But he is right in saying that there were rumours going about that Lawson would be replacing Ricardo, and if this were the case that it was started by New Zealand's media and Liam's manager just spreading the seeds of doubt, then you know what? I'm kind of okay with it. In my own opinion, this is the upping of the ante of that promise that was given by Red Bull last year after what Liam Lawson was able to do on the actual grid amongst real F1 drivers in real machinery, not just in simulators. It's been a long time since New Zealand has been fired up about a Formula One driver from their own country and that they could realistically be in with a shot of winning a Grand Prix. And the last time that happened was back in the 70s. Denny Holm doing the job at the 1974 Argentine Grand Prix. Incidentally, in a McLaren car, which was also founded by a Kiwi. And Bruce McLaren was the only other New Zealand driver to win a Formula One World Grand Prix. And yes, I know about Brendan Hartley and his time at Toro Rosso, and that that time was not particularly fruitful. What it proved to me, like with many other drivers that try F1 and it doesn't work out for them, is that sometimes a particular car is just not their cup of tea or it's not their bag. Instead, you look to the other categories that Brendan takes part in and realise, oh, he's good at that instead. Hartley's really good at sports cars. He has four World Endurance Championship titles, and he's won Le Mans twice. As for Liam, F1 seems made for him, and that was in an Alfa Tauri, which was not the best car on the grid. Yes, it did get better, as Sonoda and Ricardo proved, and then the 2024 iteration of it, under Racing Bulls, is proving to be continuing that upward trend to the point where the next race could define the course of Aston Martin's season. Whether they'll be chasing after Mercedes for fourth place and potentially a little bit more prize money, or maybe they're trying to fend off the likes of Racing Bulls, and indeed even Haas, because they've got upgrades for Imola, and Aston Martin are praying that their upgrades for Imola will work. This will define their season, I guarantee you. Naturally, if Racing 
Boxing Bulls do keep on gathering pace and fight for points consistently, then Liam will be pushing for that 2025 spot that he was supposedly entitled to. And he wants that spot ideally with Red Bull, the people who funded his path towards the top tier of single-seater motorsport, and the pinnacle of motorsport itself in the eyes of many people across the world of media. But the lack of enthusiasm from the upper management and the guy in charge of the junior squad is starting to get under the Kiwi skin, understandably. Far too often recently, we've seen F2 talents and potential Formula 1 drivers not get the chance that they deserve. Either they're rushed into the seat and then they have to scramble around and make do with what they have, note Logan Sargent, he was brought into F1 a year too early according to Williams' initial plan, or maybe they get put in as a reserve driver with the hope of getting a chance in F1, and then it never materializes. Note Felipe Drogovic and Aston Martin, and Teo Porcher at Salva. Luckily for Teo, he's now been able to keep himself busy this year because he's got the plum working for McLaren and IndyCar, and he's also got a gig in Super Formula, so that's pretty decent. And Felipe Drogovic isn't just sitting on his bum waiting for something to happen at Aston Martin, but do you see where I'm going with this? All of this talent is going to different motorsport categories who are welcoming them with open arms, the World Endurance Championship especially. It does prove that F2's tagline of the stars of tomorrow is accurate, it's just accurate in a way they weren't expecting. Everyone else is benefiting from it apart from Formula 1. And look, I get it, F2 drivers aren't entitled to a spot in F1 off the bat, but with 2024 being the first season in a long time, or even ever, where the lineup hasn't changed over the winter, it's a telling sign that F1 is becoming a closed league where you have to be not only talented, but popular on social media and asset rich, and also pushing out an existing Formula 1 driver who is probably quite popular already, as well as rich in many other types of assets. It's a really difficult game for any young gun in this day and age to try and get their way into the top tier of the motorsport. You have to be working on your social media platform all the time to be worth it for any prospective team. Because if you're a nobody, then it makes it a little bit tricky. Well, that's exactly what Liam Lawson's been trying to do. He's been trying to up his social media profile. Drive to Survive helped in spades. His own YouTube channel is gaining more and more subscribers. More and more people are aware consistently about who Liam Lawson is and why he should be in F1 and who the kind of person he is. They can relate to him. The stuff that he did last year will remain relevant and in the public consciousness. It won't be just simply forgotten. He's clearly fed up of being on the sidelines. Whilst he would love to poetically join F1 with Red Bull, his main goal at the end of the day is to get into Formula 1 itself. That's his dream. And if Red Bull are not going to be the people that will give him that final push into the sport for the long term, then he is willing to go and look for it somewhere else. And I bet you that the moment he dropped that comment and that quote spread itself around the media circle of F1, then his manager was probably getting on the blower to many of the teams up and down the grid. Those teams would have looked at that statement and gone like, Liam's open? Oh, okay. G get on the blow to his manager. I wouldn't be surprised that in 2025, we would get a surprise announcement that Liam Lawson goes to Sauber and then Audi because they might want him alongside Hulkenberg. Don't rule Lawson out from any other team. Lawson is going to be in Formula 1 in the future, and when you couple him with Oliver Behrman and what he's doing with Haas, as well as Antonelli with Mercedes and Williams supposedly, and the fact that Toto is completely desperate and determined to get him on the grid no matter what, including that special dispensation argy-bargy, we will hopefully see Formula 1 rejuvenating a little bit, with getting three young drivers coming in the next couple of years. And that's before we find out who's going to win the 2024 F2 title. Oh, come on, you're stretching here. Did Red Bull really promise Lawson a seat for 2025? Well, Helmut Marko did. And since he represents Red Bull, and he's proven to be really good at picking junior drivers in the past, then his words do carry a lot of weight, much to the chagrin of the upper management at Red Bull, and most especially, Christian Horner. But I understand that Helmut Marko is a maverick, and he has rubbed me up the wrong way many times over the last few months. One Circus has a lot of time for his words, and how much of an impact they could make with the overall organisation. Like it or not, he does represent Red Bull in some capacity, and the overall racing outfit. And him declaring that by 2025 at the latest, Liam would be in an F1 car? That's quite a loaded statement. Now, you could easily get technical and say, well, oh, they just said F1 car. That could be in a reserve driver capacity. It could be in free practice one or something. Well, about that. Because he did those races in 2023, he is no longer eligible to be offered those FP1 slots. Therefore, he's been relegated instead, as some sort of compromise deal for not racing in 2024, to be doing extended time in the Red Bull simulator 
and maybe get some time in the RB18 extensively. Kind of like what Ferrari are doing with Behrman in the F175, the 2022 Ferrari. But that kind of remark to me initially implied that he would be placed in the second team and then be tested against either Ricardo or Sonoda. But you can tell that Lawson was still frustrated by this arrangement because up until that point, Alpha Tari had only ever had 10th places as their best and he got them a ninth place. And that would have been more than welcome at the time even though we saw Sonoda and Ricardo get better results as the season concluded. It's quite the bitter pill to swallow since it means that this year, Liam Lawson cannot have time on the F1 grid comparing himself to Ricardo and Sonoda in the V-Carbo 1, which would be the most relevant benchmark that he could possibly muster and justify even further why he should be in the sport for 2025. He's instead working in the simulators, which isn't quite the same. And yes, getting to drive the RB18 around is nice, but it's no RB20 or even V-Carbo 1. As you can probably tell, this entire situation has gotten incredibly muddied, and the comments of Helmut Marker from last year have certainly not helped Red Bull's cause. It's not only given Christian Horner a headache, but also the new team principal at racing balls or the former Afatari, Laura Mekis, in what do they do with their current lineup? Do they keep them? Do they replace them? Or do they do something else entirely? It certainly doesn't help that Daniel Ricciardo has managed to break his points drought for this year, and even though the race wasn't good for him, the team itself seems to have steadied itself after the initial fallout from the driver's clash after the first race, which also worked in its favour in calming Yuki down and settling himself into the role as their new Pierre Gasly. The constant for the team, the morale booster, somebody who's been there with them, who's grown with them, and therefore can be working alongside Daniel Ricciardo, who's the wise old hand. Luckily, those two have managed to figure things out because I thought this was going to be a major head-to-head -head about the future, about who's going to get that second Red Bull seat. But right now, they realise that, oh, racing balls are quite competitive. So maybe we might be able to try and get that fifth place that we were craving at the beginning of the season. Aston Martin look weak, they look divided. Ooh, that could be a major scalp for that team, and Red Bull will be pretty happy if that happens. Those two are now starting to work together, which I am sort of happy with, but also sad because that was going to be spicy, but I oh will. They're actually thinking about teamwork. Because I do think if that team can keep racking up consistent points finishes and catch up to the top five teams simply because both drivers are scoring, then why would the team want to risk disrupting that trend? I realistically think that if Sonoda and Ricardo keep this up, then they might not see any need to replace either of them with Liam Lawson because it's proving to work. Why fix something that ain't broke? And it's evident in Laura Mecki's comments in what they are doing with Daniel Ricardo. Instead of just dropping him at the first opportunity this year, they are doing the opposite. They are looking really hard at erasing the limitations that are making Daniel not happy with the car. And so far, it proves to be working. They changed his chassis and it sort of lifted Daniel's spirits to what we saw in China and what we saw in Miami. Yes, again, the race was not that great, but that was down to a setup change, which he regretted, and something that we saw with Lewis Hamilton, who got a second in the sprint in China, and then he had a completely mm, anonymous race. I bet the focus of this year with Daniel Ricciardo, with the Red Bull organization, is to prove that Daniel's talents have not disappeared. He is not in the decline, and that his time at McLaren was just a bit of a blip that oh it was just because he was incompatible with that car oh he didn't gel well with mclaren especially since zach brown is doing everything in his power to completely destabilize the red bull organization by saying oh dominoes will fall there and oh they're not looking all that good yeah zach's playing mind games with christian i may be a mclaren fan but i see what he's doing and it's uh not exactly clean but I'm also glad that all of this favouring Daniel is not affecting Yuki in the slightest. I needn't have worried, because in fact, this turned out to be Yuki's best season ever so far. And Melbourne turned out to be just the start of what he could do. Miami, I think, was even better because he scored in both races, the sprint and the Grand Prix itself. That was a really solid effort for Yuki. Fantastic. But can you see where I'm going with this? Both drivers at Racing Bulls are doing pretty well right now. And the team is looking quite happy with this lineup. So again, why change it? It's seemingly becoming the case that there is less and less room for Liam Lawson in this iteration of the second Red Bull team. This team under the guise of racing bulls and being led by Lauren Mekis and the new CEO Peter Bayer are looking to what the team is worth in the Red Bull organization, the Horner Empire. It is a money-making machine and not the Red Bull wheelhouse where the stars of tomorrow in their junior driver ranks are guaranteed to have a chance for a year or two to see whether or not they are worthy of joining the senior team. That formula, that way of doing things is no longer the case. They said so themselves. They might try 
and keep up with that trend, but it's not their main priority anymore. Their main priority is to be competitive, to appease the shareholders. That's what they're doing. And yes, Liam Lawson did please the shareholders last year, but so far, Daniel Ricciardo is pretty much one of their major priorities. And they've seen it starting to work in Shanghai and Miami. It might continue even more so with the upgrades proving to be quite good with them. Yuki's doing really well. They might be in the hunt for fifth place. It's all looking good. So why destabilize that with somebody who we've seen was determined to undermine and outperform Tsunoda. And if you do that, that makes Tsunoda angry. And then you get mistakes happening. You want to keep Tsunoda happy. You want to keep Ricardo happy. Both drivers are happy right now, so don't rock the boat. That's why I think Mekis, Horner and Bayer are thinking right now. So as a result, it's meant that Liam's biggest contribution to the F1 world is him being camera fodder for whoever's directing the TV coverage of the Grand Prix. They always cut to Lawson. Every single time. No joke. I, just, just keep an eye out for future races, right, if you haven't seen it already. And if you have seen it already, you'll know where I'm getting at. So this escalation of pressure from Liam's management is stirring up rumours regarding Daniel Ricciardo's future, whilst unfair and not entirely professional, are understandable. New Zealand is pushing for Lawson to get into the sport. They have seen it firsthand that Liam is capable of being an F1 driver who isn't going to be spending the majority of his time at the back of the grid. They want to have their own representative at the top table, whereas their biggest neighbour Australia has two of them currently. One is a superstar who has won many Grand Prix and generates a lot of wealth and a lot of interest for the sport, and another is a championship contender for the future. My boy, Oscar Piastri at McLaren. I'll be making a video about him in the future about why his performance in Miami was kind of overlooked in the wake of Landon Norris getting his first Grand Prix, which by the way I'm happy for. But New Zealand wants a piece of that too, because they've seen that Lawson and Piastri can go toe to toe with one another, not only in F2 and the junior categories, but also at the Italian Grand Prix. Piastri and Lawson, they had a duking it out at the Italian Grand Prix, and I want more of that. But I can also tell that Red Bull is not really subscribing to what Liam Lawson is trying to do here, as well as what he can offer the team in the future. They are trying to keep the status quo right now because everything else in terms of the overall organization of the team is starting to crumble slightly. So therefore, Liam Lawson is playing a really clever game in the eyes of social media and where the fandom of the sport is headed. He practically had an episode of Drive to Survive dedicated to him and his plight. He vocalized his frustration. The brand new fans saw what he could do and that he had been denied the opportunity to extend that opportunity even further. The fandom are behind him. They want Lawson in the sport. He wants to be in the sport. He and his team are pressuring Red Bull to honor the promise that Helmut Marko gave them last year that Lawson would be in an F1 car of theirs in 2025 and that they would continue to fuel the comments that Lawson made himself that if he can't do it with Red Bull, he will go somewhere else. He wants to be in F1. That's his dream first and foremost. And I assure you that all of these other teams will be scrabbling over each other to try and secure his signature. Because as we saw with Piastri and Alpine, a team who wants you now is better than a team who might want you later if it's convenient for them. And something that we want as a fandom right now is some stiff competition for Red Bull. And given upgrades are coming for this next race for Ferrari and McLaren, I feel that the domination era of Red Bull might be ending. I'm not saying that the successful streak is ending. Domination and success are two different things. Something that I elaborate on further in this video here that you can go and watch right now. Ooh, don't miss it.